All right. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, this is my first Pi Ohio talk. Actually, second time attending. So uh, pretty excited to be here. I'm excited that I could wear the shirt somewhere and have people get it and <laughs> not, not, instead of look at you know like I'm making some kind of political statement or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, I'm excited for that too. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've uh, been in the software business for a long time now, uh, mainly doing C, C++, uh, mainly doing C, C++ development, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of incidental Python. So I'm definitely not a Pythonista by any stretch. So uh, any, any misstatements I make are out of ignorance, not malice. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, but so this, this thing that I'm going to talk about today, Google Protobuf, is something that I've used in, it's just popped up time and time again as a, a good tool to fix problems that I've encountered. Uh, so let's get on with it. What are protocol buffers? Um, they're designed by or developed by Google. It was developed as one of their, what they call them, I don't know, 10% pro projects. They're, they're extracurricular projects. So. Uh, but it, it's been widespread adopted throughout Google. Uh, they use it in, I don't want to say all of their projects, but many of them. Um, it's, it's an extensible language, platform neutral, uh, efficient way to encode data. So, yeah. So, at, the, at, the, at its core, what it does is it takes, you know, various arbitrary data makes it as small as possible, not using compression, but just using uh, clever encoding. Um, and as I said, it's, it's widely used in Google. Uh, I think they're, I read on their web, in the, the GitHub page that they, somebody did a search of their repo and there's over 40,000 uh, .proto files, which are kind of the source code of that. So it's, uh, and it's open source and patent free. So that's all good. Um, the three benefits that you get from Protobuf that gets me coming back to it time and time again is the backward compatibility is easy to get. Uh, it's, they designed it for that, for that purpose uh, so they don't have to you know, upgrade all their servers at the same time to talk the same language. Um, the encoding is very efficient and uh, the code to parse these buffers is uh, automatically generated so there's not a, not a, a byte of handwritten code where you have to you know, oh, well, this is this kind of field. I need to convert that to a, a you know, an int or whatever. That it's all built in. Um, this was largely stolen from their protobuf for GitHub as well. Uh, basically, they they made a comparison to XML. The XML is great for a lot of things. Uh, I use it a lot. Uh, it's very very readable. Uh, it's it's very wordy though. Um, if you're doing something at scale. So either, you know, something at the scale of Google where you have, I don't know how many, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, whatever, however many servers they have, they need something that scales. Uh, and, and, you know, when they're, I don't want to see what their bandwidth bill is, but <laughs> uh, shaving one byte off of every packet they send to their server, I'm sure saves them, you know, a lot of money. So compared to XML, it's three to 10 times smaller, uh, 20 to 100 times faster for parsing. Um, the data accessors are automatically generated, so there's, there's a, a simplicity there that you may not get with XML, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, it's really well, in, in addition, so what attracted me to it is for this talk is that it's in addition to using it at large scale deployments all over the world, uh, you can also use it for very limited bandwidth or limited RAM, limited uh, storage, so forth. Like, so like little devices. So that's what I'm going to show later. I've got some kind of antiquated little devices, but that's what I had. So that's what I went with. Um, it, who, did anybody go to uh, Greg Sabota's talk yesterday? No? Yeah. Okay. Um, he showed off this little $5 system on a chip, the ESP8622 or 8266, yeah, and it was, a, he, he threw a, a, an Arduino into the audience that here you can have this, you don't, you don't need to use these anymore because 
it, that thing is pretty awesome. So um, I don't have those. So <laughs> I have uh, something maybe hopefully a little more familiar to, to people who aren't into like small computing devices. So and, and I should add that all this, everything, the slides and my code and everything will be, it's on GitHub. So uh, at the end, there'll be a you know, links page and so you can pull all this stuff down and look at my terrible code. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the reasons to use Protobuf. Uh, some of the reasons that uh, you might not use it is if you have really big data sets. Uh, the Google Protobuf page says if you're sending like more than a megabyte in a, in a chunk, maybe you think of something else. That said, I read in a, a forum recently that uh, somebody was complaining about, eh, we're not, we're not so happy with protobufs because we're, we're throwing around 64 megabyte packets and it's just not holding up. It's like, well, <laughs> it wasn't designed for that. Um, and as you asked, uh, this it's a binary format. It's They're not interested in making this human readable or editable. This is something that you put in the pipe. It shrinks it down, sends it over the pipe, or, or maybe you're saving data you know, to a hard disk or whatever. But the idea is it's not, it's not meant to be something that you can just open up a, a browser and say, oh, well, let's look at all the fields in this, in this structure. Uh, that's not going to happen. So and because of that, you can't do things like interleave other, like if you're, if you, like XML, it's really easy to stuff some JavaScript or you know, HTML or something like that in there. But this, you're not going to do that. Um, okay, so like, uh, stop me if you've heard this one, being Python developers, but they, they've kind of had a schism in their world too, between <laughs> Proto 2 and Proto 3. Uh, <laughs> I, it's not fair to say it's a schism. It's, Proto 2 came out 10 years ago. It, a lot of people use it. Uh, last year, July 2016, they released stable Proto 3, it's recommended for all new code. Did you just say backwards compatibility was one of the benefits? It, it is, it is. But in terms of, of making your message definitions and stuff, because the part of Proto 3 is they really made it, uh, the, the language less wordy and, and just it's better to use it this way. And it's, it's basically an iteration on Proto 2. And, and yeah, they, they kept backwards compatibility as much as possible. But, Generally speaking, you wouldn't be mixing the two anyway. It's more the backward compatibility is more within when you set up. A, initially, you set up your system and you have your packets and whatever that you want to send. And then later, as the system grows and evolves, you're like, oh, we got to send new data. We don't need that data anymore, and so forth. That's the backwards compatibility that I'm talking more about. But and the only reason I really mentioned Proto2 is because a lot of the docs on, on the GitHub for Protobuf, all their examples are still in Proto2. So it's going to just to avoid, you know, prepare you for the possibility of confusion. There's going to be, you'll look at the examples, you'll look at the, the, the language reference, and, and they don't match up. Well, I shouldn't say that. All the examples will be in Proto2, but you want to do it in Proto3, and it's not hard to map one to the other. Okay, so how do you use it just from a, a workflow uh, standpoint? Uh, so the protocol mess protobuf messages are defined in a plain text file, usually with .proto is, is the file name extension. And those are then compiled down to uh, the, the generated, uh, the, your target language that you want to use with protobuf with use this proto compiler to generate the uh, data access classes in the target language that you're interested in. So Python 2 and 3, Java, C++, there's all the, yeah. And there's also a lot of uh, additional third party plugins. So these are the ones that they support just kind of out of the box. You can get additional third party, you know, open source plugins that people have written to support other languages, you know. So uh, it's definitely, a uh, a vibrant uh, community, the, a lot of activity on this this project's proto, uh, this project's GitHub is, uh, you know, even now, even after ten years, so uh, it's definitely a thriving uh, and broadly used uh, technology. Um, 
and you can get pre-built binaries so you don't have to deal with any of the problems of, you know, sometimes you've got to build the packages from source and all that. You can do that if you want, but um, especially with, with Python, you know, they uh, the, the Python package index, I'm pretty sure. I, I know they have it for Python 3, probably have it for Python 2 as well. Just, you know, you can just do a pip install protobuf and you're done. Um, so, so the, the, so the basic flow goes like this. You, you start with your, your proto file, you run it through the proto compiler. It, in this case, for our purposes, you know, it generates this foo underscore pb2.py. Um, this naming isn't so flexible. They always append underscore pb2, even if you're in proto3, which is kind of, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, 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 a, there's some, some rough edges that I don't know why they haven't <laughs> sanded them down, but um, just be aware of that. Like you, because it, it's in the, it's in the doc proto file that you specify which version of the language you're using. And it just, it generates the right thing, but it, it doesn't uh, reflect in the name. And then, and then you just, you know, import it into your, your app, your application, just like you would any other uh, Python module. Um, okay, so as you might expect, any kind of uh, data encryption uh, language is going to have support for, uh, you know, a lot of numeric types, so double float. Um, they got a bunch of different 32 and 64 bit integer types, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, later because they're, they're important distinctions about those. Um, string support, uh, most languages, UTF-8 only. Python, there's some kind of Unicode support that I haven't fully grokked, but um, you know, if that's important to you, it's definitely an option. Um, bool, we all know what that is. Um, bytes, though, if, if, if their string type doesn't cut it for you or you, know, you need some other bag of bytes, bytes is the type for you. Um, enums, if you're familiar with C and C++, they have the concept of an enum. It's basically just a bunch of named constants that are in a group. So those, those allow you to have kind of a, a set of predefined values that you can give meaningful names to instead of, oh, that's type one. You could say, oh, that's a, you know, that's a, a Corvette. Um, and then finally, there's this any type, which is, it's like a bag of bytes, but you can also give it a URL to say, this is how you interpret what this bag of bytes is. So I haven't used that before. It sounds pretty cool, but uh, just haven't used it, so I could, couldn't say too much about that. OK. Um, so yeah, I mentioned before that there's uh, different ints for different uses. Most of them have a variable length encoding, and that's, that's where Protobuf picked up a lot of its compression, uh, or I don't want to call it compression, encoding uh, efficiency. But uh, some of them don't. So it's important to know that the type of int that you're using matches what the values you expect to go into it. So for instance, if you have, they have an int 32, which sounds like, oh, you can put any kind of integer in there. Well, no. It, if you're expecting data that's mostly uh, positive integers, then int 32 is, is okay to use because if there's a possibility it might be, uh, might go negative, then int 32 is probably okay. But if it's often that you're gonna have signed uh, values that go negative, then you would use the s int 32. And similarly, if you use, if you know they're always gonna be a uh, positive, then uh, you would use the, the u int 32. Um, and the reason being that they've got, uh, well, I'll get into that in a bit. I talk more about the encoding. And then um, finally, uh, doubles and floats are, they don't encode very well because, uh, you know, generally speaking, there's, you know, if you're gonna, if you take the value of, of one over three and put that in a float, it's, it's, you probably don't care about the 19th digit of precision, but the protobuf has no way of knowing that. So if at all possible, scale your, scale your floats and doubles into int, int values that you can get a more, compact range from and you'll get better encoding. Okay, um, some other notable features. Uh, 
messages can be nested, so you can have, it's kind of like, you can think of it as uh, C++ classes or, or uh, the equivalent in, in Python of basically you can define a class within another class such that only, uh, you know, you have some, some scoping as effectively, so you can allow, you know, a little bit of a uh, OO, I guess. I mean, this isn't meant to be like a full programming language, but it, it does have kind of an object-oriented way of, of specifying how your data is structured. Um, likewise, you can use messages as fields within. So really, if you, again, if you know C or C++, this is, you're going to see, I'm going to show a proto, a simple proto in a minute, and you'll see that it uh, basically looks like a C struct. And that's a way to, a good way to think of it if you're familiar with those. Um, it also, the, the, the language has associated maps, so you can, you know, it's like a dict in, in Python. Um, they've also, in, Py, in Proto 3, added a, uh, in addition to the binary encoding, you can do a JSON encoding and decoding. So, um, you know, give you a little more flexibility with maybe existing uh, uh, deployments and such. And then you can also import uh, definitions from other protos. So it's, uh, again, using the C metaphor, it's, it's just like a header file that you can bring in for, to build up more complicated messages because you don't generally want to try and stuff all of your message types into one proto if you don't need to. Okay. Um, so here's a simple proto file. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, like I said, it looks a lot like a C struct if you're familiar with that. Uh, there's some keywords, like, so message is a keyword. Uh, so there's data types that I talked about before. There's enum keyword. And, and, that, and, and that's the, a, a pretty good example of, of what a, a very simple proto buff message might look like. So here's, I've named my message type uh, sensor data. So it's got a, a temperature, a humidity, and, and I, a, an enum that I use so I can say which kind of units I, are, I've specified the temperature in. And so now, here where it d diverges a bit from C, they have these, these tag identifiers, and this is kind of key to how they in, uh, achieve their, their uh, encoding uh, efficiency, because these, th these tags specify basically the, the order in which messages are uh, kind of serialized, deserialized, and also they're, they're used to uh, handle cases where, because all of these, I, I guess I should mention that, that all of these fields are optional. So I could send an empty, well, not an empty sensor data, but I could send a, a packet that's got a sensor data message in it that I didn't change anything in, and protobuf will just supply default values to all those things. And in that case, it will send it very efficiently because, because these are all considered optional. The, the sender, when they encode this message, they won't, it actually shouldn't encode to very many bytes at all because it's not going to send any of the values that I didn't set. It's just going to basically send a token saying this value should take its default. Right, so the, the question is, yeah, do you have to specify the tag IDs? Yes, uh, that's kind of an irritation, but um, it's, uh, it actually turns out it, it's, it, I, I used to think, well, why, why can't they just do that automatically for me? But um, in a minute, I'll get to like some of the reasons why they can't, but yeah, you have to specify them. Okay, so this is, uh, again, I mentioned the, the we use the, the, the proto, proto C or Protoc compiler is what generates this code that does the, this parsing and, and encoding of the data that's specified in the proto files. Um, that command line there is what you would typically use to generate a Python output. Uh, you can generate all the, all the languages that supports, you can generate them all in the same invocation of Protoc. So, if you you know if you've got this cross language system that you're developing and you you know you want to generate Ruby and Java and, and Python and all that you can specify them all in the same command line and have it all generated at once. Um, and like any good utility, you can 
invoke it with help and it will help. Um, and then the output is a, uh, in, in the case of Python, it's, it's going to be a static descriptor of each message type, which along with the meta class, you could use in your, your Python program to uh, access the class at runtime. So here's an example of what they serializing that previous message would look like. You create, create an instance of one of these sensor data objects and so you know the name comes the the, the module name comes from the, the you know the file name that Protoc generated. Uh, so simple in this case uh, PB2. And then you set your value fields to whatever you want them to be and like I said before if you leave one out it'll just get the default value and so I didn't have to set all these and I probably to demonstrate that I probably shouldn't have set them all but anyway. Uh, and then you call it serialize the string and that does just what you think it would which is takes that sensor data uh, message turns it into a little little string of bytes and then you're ready to do whatever you want to do with it. Send it over the wire, whatever. On the, on the other end, the receiver of this data, they, they get this, this serialized data chunk. Again, they create a, a simple sensor data object called parse from string, and then they can access the fields to do whatever they want. So, and again, if, if the sender hadn't sent, a, say, a temperature when when I read this temperature here, I would just get the default value, which is typically for, for numeric in, uh, values of zero. And in fact, if you look back at this, uh, one reason, one reason, uh, see there's a, this enum here has got a, uh, a value of zero. That's, you have to start your enums with a value of zero because that's what Protoc will understand to be the default for that enum type. You don't have to have them in order after that, but you do have to have a zero. All right, so, okay, let's do a little, uh, little uh, command line thing here. I'm just gonna show where, uh, simple example, where do I want? Stopped. Hmm. I don't know why that is displaying, no? What's that? Projector oh, projector's on. I, I can see the light in there. Uh, hmm. Well, I don't. Well, this is an unexpected bonus. See if I can figure it out here. I want to. <sighs> What's that? Yeah. Yeah, but this is <laughs> never happened. This always works. <clears throat> yes. There we go. Let's get it. All right. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I was going to just show you a little example of that. So uh, here I've got that. Uh, the simple proto again. So this is what I showed before. Uh, in addition, I'll just point out here that there's that up at the top here. I specify the syntax as proto three. Uh, if it's not there, it assumes proto two. Um, so again, this is just what we were looking at before. And now the that example that I that I showed. Uh, well, first of all, I'll show you how to do that. So 
Pro Talk. Okay, I can type Python out is dot something dot proto. Okay, so that's that's how you're on the compiler. Pretty neat, huh? Um, and then we'll run the simple thing. So let me just scroll that up a bit here so everyone can see. So in that so you can see the payload length is nine bytes. So this is, it's sending basically 12 bytes of data because we've got a, there was a float, an SN32 or a U32 and an enum. So mapping that again to like a, a C world, that would be, if you were just sending a raw struct over the wire in C, you might naively just dump the struct and that would cost you 12 bytes. This is only nine and it's also got the structure encoded in it. So you can see already it's, it's a, a reasonably, you know, decent encoding savings over just putting raw, raw bytes on the wire uh, without even getting the structure that you need. So I'm, I'm probably saying this poorly, but this is less, less bytes to send just the, the raw amount of data that you would otherwise, but you're also getting the structure of the data in that encoding as well. So that's that clear make sense yeah okay good my job is done <laughs> okay so yeah let's go back to this hopefully it doesn't mess up the display oh, it will put me at hmm. you can see I'm an expert at giving presentations it's very smooth um, yeah, so there we go, command line. All right, so let's talk a little bit about backward compatibility. So Proto 2 to Pro 3 is not what I'm talking about here. It's, this is more along the lines of if you've got, you've got a server or a device deployed in the field and it's using like the first, the early version of your, your protocol definition. And let's say now you want to add some fields or change how it's set, you know, the structure of it or whatever. Um, Protobuf's got that built in, um, and they just have a few rules to guarantee backward compatibility. Uh, and that is, one of them is that those numeric tags that I mentioned earlier, you can't reuse those once you've, once you've deployed it. Like, let's say I want to get rid of the temperature field, so that was tag two. Once I've deployed that, I can't reuse that if I, even if I want to stop using the temperature field. It's, that's just part of the, that allows the old deployed devices to keep functioning when they get a new message that doesn't have that field. So new fields are ignored by old clients. Uh, and likewise, if an old client sends a field that's been deleted, uh, new clients or new users of the protocol will just ignore it as well. So that's uh, kind of the, the beauty of it is you don't have to care what you don't have. There's none of this. I mean, you can still do it, but you don't have to do a, an explicit check when you get a packet. Oh, is this a version nine of the packet? Then do this and this. Instead, you just say, oh, I'm going to read this packet, and if temperature's there, great. If not, deal with that. But if you know upfront that you have to deal with the possibility of getting default or, or missing data, then, then versioning you know, becomes not such an explicit problem. You just deal with it implicitly when you're deciding how to handle your packets from start. Um, okay, so and, and then it, uh, the encoding efficiency. In that previous example, I showed there was you know nine bytes to send twelve, uh, plus the structure was in there too. Um, the way they do that is by looking at the properties of the data. And for instance, like when you're sending integers, a lot of the times the integers you're sending are, are not two to the twenty-three. They're you know, 12, yeah. So they, they, the guys at Google, you know, figured, you know, that, that's the common use case. So they use a couple of approaches. One is called bar ints, which is uh, basically, if you're only, if you only need, say, a byte to encode a value, then just use a byte. Um, and they do that by basically using the, I think the most significant bit of each byte 
to signify whether or not the value continues. So, and that, and zigzag encoding, so that's for when you have a situation where your values, <clears throat> excuse me, then jump around zero, so negative and positive. Uh, zigzag encoding is another way, uh, and you can read the details in the GitHub about how it works, but the, basically the idea is you keep all those small magnitude numbers should have small encoding. And uh, as I mentioned before, the selection of the data type makes a big difference in, in the how efficiency, how efficient the encoding is. So if you use an int 32 or 64 for negative values, uh, Protobuf is going to encode those using 10 bytes each uh, for the 64 value, the int 64 case, um, and maybe even the int 32 case. So definitely you need to make some, you know, intelligent decisions about your, your type of, of uh, uh, data, that your the representation of your data. Um, and then also the fields that you use that you expect to appear frequently, those should have lower tag numbers than those that don't. So like the first 15 tags should, are, are going to be your most frequent tag uh, fields. Um, those will get encoded using a one byte for the tag information. And then the next step up is to 2047. So your first 20,000 or 2047 uh, field values should be your most common ones. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, it does matter much. Okay, let's do another command line thing. See if I can lose the display again. This so time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have to be sequential. They just they just have the the those few restrictions about. I think you have to have a one one that's got tag one, and then but after that you can go nuts with ordering and yeah. Okay, so just another example uh, showing the efficiency again. So uh, let's see here. Let's get this one's a little more. Uh, it's not going to be. Uh, I'll just cat this here. It's a bunch of different ways of encoding that same message. What it boils down to is, I've got a, a proto here where I want to just show how the choice of, of data type can affect the encoding uh, efficiency. So what I've done is I've, I've taken that same sensor data guy again, and, and I've introduced this new sensor data history uh, uh, message type. So basically, I could send a bunch of, a bunch of sensor data uh, messages all in one group, and in this case, I'm, I've written a little, you know, a little Python script to just bundle up a package of 20 of them, and just to show the uh, how how the efficiency efficiency can vary based on the uh, encoding that you choose for for the uh, values. So, well, in every case, the it's sending uh, 20, 20 of those sensor data messages. And again, in, in a C, C++ world, that would be the equivalent of 12 bytes of, of data. So you've got your temperature is four bytes, the, the uh, humidity is four bytes, and then the four bytes for the um, unit type. So in the first case, it's, I've used, I used a float to encode them. And, also, I varied the, the kind of range of values just to show you how the encoding can vary based on the values that you're putting in those fields. So here in this case, I've got some negative, you know, a lot of my, all my numbers are negative. And so you can see sending this floats is still 220 bytes for 20, word, uh, 20 of those sensor data. So it's 11 bytes per, per packet or per struct, which is still less than the uh, total size un, un, unencoded or uncompressed. And it's got the, the uh, structure in there as well. But then you see if, if I use SIT32 instead of a float, now, I've, now I'm down to uh, nine bytes per, per uh, sensor data message. And, but now if I go down to, uh, now my, all my values are positive. So now you can see the difference between using an int. So up here, I was using an int 32, and I was putting all negative values in there. So I was ending up with 17 bytes per message. Now, 
using the right data type, I'm down to 180 bytes, so you know, nine bytes per, per uh, sensor data message. So the point is, data, data type matters. <laughs> and then you get, when you get down to really big numbers, you don't, you don't see a lot of state. Yes? Okay, yeah, so the question is, what's the difference between s int and int? Is that? Well, more, more the point is, is you stated they were different. And then on your second example, they have the same amount of data. Uh, oh, I was saying the int, int 32 versus this int 32. I yeah, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, up here, all my, all my values that I'm putting into my temperature are, are negative, and I'm putting them into an int 32. So that's... I'm, it, 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 that results in this really inefficient encoding. But down here, um, my values are all positive because they're right around 50. And so I, the, the using int32 doesn't penalize you there because none of the values have gone negative. Any other questions on that? All right, moving on. All right. Okay. Back here. All right. Oh, uh, so not yet. No questions yet. Uh, so now I wanted to give a more in-depth worked example of how this all kind of rolls together. So I've got over here, I've got a Raspberry Pi and a, uh, an Arduino Mega, although I got it working on a Uno as well. Uh, the point being, this protobuf is running on both of these, and you know, it's it's. This is a mega, so it's got 32 megs of of uh, 32k, no, 32k of, of storage. This protobuf plus the the whole uh, Ethernet stack takes about 10% of the storage on on that uh, Arduino, and then on the Raspberry Pi, it's you know, we're not so concerned about storage and How such. Well, well, it's it's it depends on the the language. So, like, oh well. So for C in particular, they have there's a there's a third party uh, package called Nano PB, and that's what I'm running on the Arduino. That's uh, I think they said 3K is is the you know the size of the library on on the on the embedded device. So. This, yeah, so that Arduino is, is running C, C++, you know, well, it's, the, it's the Arduino language, you know, which we all know is C. Um, and that's what's running on there. Um, so, all right, yeah, so what I've done here is I've got uh, basically uh, an extension of that sensor data class. So let's say I've got, um, I've, I've come up with a simple, I've got my little network of Arduinos deployed all over my farm to give me temperature and humidity readings throughout the day. Um, so, and let me just show you what that looks like. What, how's my time doing? Too late, okay. Um, where is controller? No, no, no. Oops. Okay, so so here's I won't go into all the particulars, but basically this is the the message system that I've set up. Basically, I set up a this is a kind of like the top level message that is used to communicate between between my our deployed Arduinos and my controller guy that's you know sitting on my laptop and, and or my desktop or whatever at home. Um, and this is like just a simple protocol that I've set up so that I can, when, when the devices in the field want to connect to the controller, they send one of these connect messages. Uh, when the controller wants to tell it to do something, the controller can send them a command message. And right now, the only command type I have is report. So 
that's what that third report is. That would be like the the deployed deployed uh, nodes would be using report messages to report their data back to the controller. And here's the report. Uh, looks should look familiar, at least for the temperature and humidity part of it. There's our friend's sensor data. Uh, so basically, here's an example of, of nesting. So I've got my report. And within the report, I've nested the sensor data class or message type. And then down here is an actual instance of the sensor data field. So this report message has two fields. There's a device identification field, which is defined up here, which is an ID uh, and, a, and an aim string. And then that's used for a lot of the, so for like connect message, basically I can connect to the controller and that allows me to identify it, who I am so the con controller can keep track of who's who. Um, so that's, uh, okay, that's all well and good, but um, so now I've written a, a little controller class that basically sits there and wait in a thread for network connections. Now, because I'm a coward, I didn't do this with like wireless devices, so it's all, it's all hardwired ethernet, but you know, don't let that distract you because it's, uh, it works just as well, in fact, even better over low bandwidth connections. But this is just so I had one last potential disaster for this talk. Um, <laughs> I get a Greg Sabota who, you know, he did all his wireless and it was like real time debugging and yeah, I don't have the heart for that. So, um, <laughs> so I just did it all wired, but you know, don't, uh, don't, don't hate me for that. Um, okay. So anyway, I got my, my controller is running here on my laptop and it's waiting for uh, UEP connections from, from anything that speaks, that knows it's there. So, uh, Let's see, do I, I'm going to, oh yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and, so I've got, this Arduino is just set up, it, it, it just, the first thing it does is when it powers up is it just tries to make a connection. So I'm going to just reset it now, and, and now in a, in a few seconds we should see, you know, a response coming to the controller that says, yeah, yeah, all right, I got a connection from, you know, that IP address, and so now the controller is going to periodically send messages to the Arduino saying, Every second, or I think every five seconds, give me a report of your current data. So you can see it's reporting temperature and humidity. I don't, another cowardly thing that I didn't have temperature or sensors or anything like that. Those are just random numbers. They, they're randoms, but they have variation, so it looks like it's realistic, but it's not. It's really not 27. Well, it might be 26 degrees Celsius. What's that? <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, that's neat. Um, so now we got this this guy running, and let's say now it comes along, and, I, and I've got I've got my Raspberry Pi here, and I decide, you know what, that thing's got a lot of power. I can send a lot more information, so I'll send a little bit more, um, and that is uh, and that's what this is. So this is fancy sensor. So if if you go to my my GitHub repo, um, you'll see. All the code laid out, and you know, I think I called the, the Arduino one is called CUNY sensor, and this is Fancy sensor, and Fancy sensor does so much more than CUNY sensor. Um, so that's do I have the profile here? Did I cheat? No. Um, uh, it's called sensor version two. So now, is that readable? Yeah, okay. Um, I've added a few things to this protocol. So it, now I've, I've added this history. So I kind of denoted my changes for version two of the protocol with this comment here. Protobuf doesn't care about comments, so I've just put it there for illustration purposes. So inside of my device identification message, I've also added this new field, keeps history, uh, so that the controller can act accordingly. Um, also, down, uh, I've also added our new uh, commands. So, in addition to reporting data, now I can also report, tell, the, tell the, the remote guy to report data history and clear your data history. So, and 
and then there's some adjustments here to the the sensor the, so the report message is kind of scrolled off there but the important thing is now I've added this repeated sensor data data history uh, field which this repeated keyword tells protobuf you can have zero or more of these whereas normally like the, the, the field right above it data you can only have zero or one this repeated says zero or more and then the top level message thing is still the same so so like right now if I run if I run my fancy sensor and yeah so I'll pop over to this window so you see it's it's recognized this new connection um, right there so there's device ID neat and the device name is El Luchador but you can see it's still only sending old old data so for here from 1337 or not old data but it's it's only the controller doesn't know that this is a fancy sensor yet so because I haven't upgraded the controller yet to speak the new version of the protocol so the new fancy sensor is already sending or potentially sending this new uh, version of the, of the protocol but the controller isn't asking for it yet so now let's go ahead and kill that controller and let's run controller version 2 um, so now let me reset this to get the get the old uh, Arduino you know continue to send out its old boring data but now okay look at this I just connected my, my Arduino connected so it's it's still using the old protocol but it's the, the uh, controller is reporting oh hey look it doesn't keep history so now I know when I talk to the old to the, the Arduino I know not to send it things that are germane to uh, keeping the history like these new commands like uh, send me your history and clear your history it, it could send it it's just gonna get ignored so it's not like you have to carefully check for this it's, it's just more for keeping things sane on the controller side but so now if I go to my fancy sensor and I run version 2 uh, now I should mention here that so that fancy sensor was uh, actually running the old protocol as well but now it's running the new protocol so I guess I lied there before but um, now I should see uh, here so now it's it's you can see the, the old uh, Arduino is still using the old protocol, so the controller is telling it, just send me your one data chunk. But now the, the, the Raspberry Pi is using the new protocol, which keeps history. And so now it's every, on the Raspberry Pi end of things, it's, it's every five seconds it's taking a new data reading. Um, so it's taking, temp, taking temperature, humidity, uh, uh, rainfall, so cumulative rainfall and uh, barometric pressure so what's what's going to happen here is it's going to you'll see it start to building up and then it gets once the controller gets to uh, a certain number of iterations through this loop it's going to send a, a clear your data history message and so you'll see you'll see all those values go away and it'll get reset too so okay yeah so there it happened there so did a report and now well, it's already catching up again but so here's where it had in the time that it, it sent the last report and they got the clear data report, uh, the Raspberry Pi had already taken two readings. So that's, that's why there's two there, but really, trust me, it works. Okay. Um, so, excuse me. Uh, yeah, so that's what GMT right. Okay, um, so that, that's, that's what I got. Uh, any questions? Uh, what's, oh, yeah, <laughs> I guess I ran right up to it, sorry. Um, but we have a break after this, so if there's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, go ahead.
Uh, well, a little bit. So, um, it basically it, it breaks down to there's an initial byte, and that's uh, that's got like the specifier of what the first field that's in this message is, and then if there's if that message is there, then that message is data, or that sorry field data is there, and then and then it has the next bytes or bits really that tell it okay is field two there okay if field two is there then here's field two's data and and so forth so but that, that's kind of big. It's a lot like ASM one maybe under the hood. I don't know if you remember ASM one. No. Okay. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but are you back there. Well, so, so the question is, how do you know when you've hit the end of your message, right? right. So yeah. The, yeah, so this doesn't solve that problem. It's, so like for, for my examples, what I did was I took that encode, encoded payload and I send an extra byte as the first byte of the, the packet. I, it's the size of the encoded payload. So I, I know, so if it's a TCP packet, it gets busted up or whatever. If I read, oh, there's supposed to be 19 bytes, and I only got four, I'll wait to get the rest of them. Yep. Is it in being aware? So if you're writing under some system, sending messages, is it aware that they encoded on a little lineage? Or yeah, that's, it's, it's not going to matter. It, it'll, yeah, it takes care of all the network and coding, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, just to repeat the question, does endiness matter? No, it doesn't. Sorry. Oh, so you want to reverse engineer the, the what? The, yeah, uh, you, I think there's enough information on the protobuf GitHub to, you know, that describes the encoding that you could figure it out. Uh, it might be a little tricky though with, like, fields that are omitted. You know, so because everything's optional. So if they only send the, uh, you know, check for valid license key, you know, message every 20 minutes. You may not catch that, and, and you might not get the full protocol. But yeah, sure, I think you could do that. Uh, yeah, so the, you, you're saying there's Wireshark modules for that. I think you have to have the proto file for that, though. I may be wrong, I, I, but I think that's what I remember seeing about that. But anyway, it should be possible. You know, you can you know, give it enough time and enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you control the default um, So the question is, can you control the default? Not in Proto 3. So that's one of the changes I've made from Proto 2 to Proto 3. In Proto 2, you can specify an arbitrary default, which was a nice feature, but uh, it made language generation a lot harder, at least for some languages. So now they have these rules like, oh, if it's a most numeric types, the default is zero. The enum default is the tag zero default, uh, is the default, um, and, and like that. So uh, in my mind, that was kind of a sad thing to lose for, you know, between going from Proto 2 to Proto 3, because I use Proto 2 a lot um, in past stuff, but uh, yeah, you get what you get. Um, well, just going on the protobuf uh, GitHub, their comparison to like the equivalent XML parsing is that it was uh, ten times faster. So it's because it is so less wordy. You just have that many few bytes to chew through, and and it's not doing any kind of fancy compression. You know, it's not you know applying some kind of you know, convoluted algorithm. It's a pretty simple algorithm, so it's pretty fast. Right. Uh, th thank you for mentioning that because. 
Yes. And, and so the, the benefit over that is you don't have to now keep, yeah, you have automatic parsing and, and you don't have to worry about, oh crap, I, we changed byte three to, uh, you know, now it's two nibbles. And yeah. You don't have to do that. It's, it's all taken care of for you. And, and You'd only do that if you, you would only be an advantage to do it the other way if you were uh, really designing the right person. Yeah, if you're an electrical engineer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an electrical engineer, so I can, it's okay. <laughs> uh, somebody who's raising their hand back there? Yes, no, okay. Well, um, I'm gonna be here a little longer, uh, heading back to Detroit soon, but if you've got any more questions, feel free to grab me. And uh, like I said, all the, I think, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's my, uh, you can find all my stuff there, I don't, I don't do the Twitter, uh, I don't do the, the Instagram, none of that stuff, so, you know, look me up on GeoCities, though. Uh. <laughs>